that sometimes because of our location and our, and our geography, you will hear a lot of Pacific leaders when they speak about their own country, they also bring in other countries of the region because we very much share the same plight in regards to climate change, in regards to the economies that we, uh, that we have, and especially in regards to the solidarity that we bring onto the issues that we have as uh, countries that are independent and also countries that are also what I would say not really independent, but part of other countries of, that are uh, in Europe or other, for example, New Zealand or other countries like France. But for us, the issue is always about distance when we ever travel and meet each other. But I must say in one sense, COVID has been a blessing in the sense, and I, and I mean that, not in a cheeky sense, but I mean that in a sense that it's allowed us to be able to communicate differently and find ways of communicating with each other differently instead of just hopping on, hopping on a plane and going uh, to the other country so that we can meet. It is, and there is nothing beats the meeting of face-to-face. -face. That's always very good. But also at the same time, because of the circumstances and the situation that we are in now, we can't basically do that. So we've got to find new methods of doing things. Well, thank you so much for painting that picture. And it really takes me to a very important question, this issue of distance. Um, Pacific Possible, um, which was a World Bank report written in 2017, that's now a distant four years away because of COVID, talked a lot about the fact that um, you know, there's a potential to accelerate growth and 500,000 new jobs that will be needed and tourism and labor market mobility between the islands and of course the majors to the left, Australia and New Zealand. But we're talking about distance. And one of the first questions that comes up for me is this issue of information, communications and technology in the time of COVID. How are you doing with that? And how uh, uh, is the affordability of ICT for a small population like yours? And how do you think the Pacific region might be able to get better, I guess, support for the rates on ICT to be such that you can get the flourishing you need in terms of education and other things that are so important and are driven by the cost of ICT? Thank you for that. Uh, I think the answer to this question needs to be contextualized against the background of changing mindsets, both in our region as well as countries that have traditionally had a colonial relationship with us. Although in the Rose country, we never were a colony, we're an administrative country, ably looked after by Australia, New Zealand and the UK. In recent speeches, I've begun to articulate such a position that we need a new paradigm, a renewal, a renaissance for our region, which is about developing a new Pacific consciousness. Now, in regards to increasing ICT affordability, we must realize that the Pacific, and especially countries like Nauru, does not always necessarily have the resources that the bigger countries and the more, and I would say the first world countries have. It's tougher for us because, for example, if you do not have an undersea cable connecting you, you could have, you're dependent on a satellite system that now and then is weather affected. And depending where you are within the atmosphere of the, of, of the earth, that, that also can play hazard with your connection. Now, I'm very grateful that our connection today is a fine sunny day here in the room. And I suppose it is also around most parts of the world where we are communicating from that's allowed us to have this clarity of, of, of discussion. Now, one of the main challenges lies in the accessibility that we have, as I've started talking about. Now, given the geographical locations of Pacific Island countries, Again, COVID-19 has reinforced the urgency and the importance of improving communications and technology. Now, yesterday I, get, I got briefed on what Elon Musk has been doing around the world. And this is a way that is actually quite affordable for countries like myself and other Pacific countries to be able to jump on board. See, the bigger countries are going in that direction. I see some telecommunication companies going in that direction. We also 
us smaller ones who need that just as much access to the IC, ICT need to be able to access that also. Increasing ICT, of course, will better education opportunities. And as we all know, education is vital for our future to provide exposure for businesses. It provides shifts in learning platforms globally in response to many things. And it'll make us familiar with things that is happening around the world. And ICT affords this. Our, our, for example, a good example is our commitment to our regional university, the University of South Pacific. It's allowed us to uh, develop an understanding the IT infrastructure where if USP uses its know-how, and because of all the uh, USP countries, specific USP countries that are part of it, can connect and use that know-how, that will be an advantage, of course, to the rest of the Pacific countries who are members of the USP. Now, having said that, to develop such an infrastructure, we will always need partners. Our scale of economy tells us we will always need partners. Our lack of certain knowledge and expertise and experience will tell us that we will always need partners. That's inevitable. And to be able to go forward, especially to, so that we can further our education, further the business opportunities, further things that can advance the economy of a country, we need those partners. And I, I have to take my hat off to countries like Australia, to like New Zealand, to like France, like Taiwan, and to other European countries that have come to our assistance and also the other big, uh, I suppose, international banks like ADB who do realise what needs to be done to bring Pacific peoples up, to be able to communicate, to be able to meet first world standards in a way that does not deteriorate they, they themselves. And they come on board and they help greatly. But again, because of the fast changing nature of the ICT world, and like I said, um, what Elon Musk is introducing is really going to be a game changer, if not already is starting to be a game changer. This is where opportunities can be used again by the bigger European countries and the bigger uh, first world countries, I should say, that, that come in and say, OK, Nauru, or OK, Kiribati, or OK, uh, Marshall Islands, or OK, uh, uh, F uh, Federal States of Micronesia, or, or Palau, or those other countries or Tuvalu, whoever they may be, this is the kind of assistance we can give you. Even though we can't run an undersea cable towards you, but we can give you an assistance that's coming, this new technology that is equivalent or even better than an undersea cable, that you will have this resource at your, that's available to you. Because one of the things that is going to be obvious also, it's not just school, it's not just business opportunities, because people are now doing medicine through Zoom or through such platforms mm -hmm. where someone can instruct a doctor here, a neuron doctor here. But when you need to do this, is this is the procedure that you go through and you can do that. You can do the basically all the awareness, all the training that needs to be done and upskilling of here without the need to jump on a plane and fly overseas to get that training. So that ICT is incredibly important, more so for us who are who've got the distance, the tyranny of distance, than to those who can just very easily communicate either by plane, or sorry, either by car or by telephone or some other some other means of communication that allows them to get to point A and point B much much quicker than us. For us, distance and of course the ocean. Even though we're we're bound by the ocean, we're united by the ocean. The ocean itself can be and an inhibiting factor in making sure we have the access on time within the, the time required to get the help when it is needed. Yes, um, yeah, the distance is crazy. I mean, I was thinking, I think from Fiji to Nauru is how many hours flying? Six hours? No, it's really nearly close to four hours. And that's and that's a that's a neighbor in the Pacific. Right. Fly to Brisbane is four and a half hours. Neighbor, right? Exactly. So four yes. hours, and that's one of your nearest neighbors, then, right? Yes. No, our nearest neighbor is, is Kiribati, and they're one hour, ten minutes away by plane. If you okay. swim, it'll take a bit. If you swim, it'll take a bit longer. 
<laughs> yes, you know, but seriously, one of the things I'm from Jamaica, I grew up in Jamaica, and I'm I'm really enthralled with the alliance of small island states, and I'm on a one woman campaign to sort of um see if we can insert in the alliance of small island states a technical working group um around issues like water technology, energy technology for the engineers of the small islands in particular to get together. And my latest bold and crazy idea is that there should be a Caribbean Space Alliance. I set off on this journey in 2018. I hunted down the people in Mauritius who have just launched the CubeSat. And so now I'm also hellbent and said, you know what, if I'm doing it for the, the Caribbean, I should be able to do it in Pacific too, so that all the 55 island states yes, can yes, have their yes. own constellation. And so I am excited because um, in World Space Week, we launched this conversation. And the reason why it's so important, not only because of the health, not only because of education, but data sovereignty over the ocean, yes. which we're going to re a reframe ourselves as big ocean, small states. I'm saying, I don't want to hear the word large ocean states because that is L-O-S spells the word loss. <laughs> so if the word is boss, big ocean. I like small boss, states. yes, yes. Big ocean, sustainable states. Right, yes. exactly. Then if we as the boss states, then if we're going to really take a control of the blue economy, we at least ought to understand the basic science and technology that goes into, um, you know, making fisheries and all the other things that the sea is used for. And you, the Pacific region has millions of equivalent, quote unquote, square miles of Pacific Ocean to manage. There's already a huge problem with people fishing in our waters. So clearly, whether or not you are doing this for research because we know it costs about right now between one and $5 million to launch a CubeSat. But I do believe at the very least, the young people at USP, University of South Pacific, should actually be, um, at least be aware of how, what is the science behind this? So that when people come selling goods or bringing gifts, you are able to understand the science behind it. I'm very, big on this. When we think about this, what is your idea about the blue prosperity in the Pacific futures? How, how do you see the possibility of this network of sensors? We had last night a conversation with the president of Seychelles, as you know, who's driving this blue economy thing. And um, it was my second time interfacing with him. And I really feel that because of the passion and leadership that he has, and also you have within the, you know, con the con the Congress, if you will, of small island state leaders, that if you set your mind to it, you can have this network of sensors and at sea and on the sea and in the air that allows your countries, your fishing communities, your ministries of fisheries across the 14 island alliance to do a better job of managing. What, what are your thoughts about this vision? Am I totally crazy or is this something you've also thought about? Well, for me, I've never thought an idea to be crazy, especially something like this that unites common purposes and common goals. I set forth that roughly when we became government, I set forth a economic uh, uh, plan and we, we, we called it a vision and we called it desperate imagination, thinking outside the box. So it's not a crazy idea. And I like your idea of, I'll call it network of bosses, I think is a good one. <laughs> that should uh, shut a lot of people up when they hear the term network of bosses. Uh, uh, in regards to blue prosperity and Pacific futures, the key priority, of course, is to is, and what we've already done is establish protected boundaries. And that is already been done for our easy zones. One of the big things that happens here in the Pacific for blue prosperity, I won't touch the mining area at the moment because that is uh, quite, con I wouldn't say controversial. Nauru doesn't find that controversial. But I want to talk about just the fishing that happens in the region. In the region, 
we have a group called FFA Forum Fisheries Agencies. Now, under that, I wouldn't say under that, but next to that is what we also call the parties to the Nauru Agreement. The parties to the Nauru, Nauru Agreement is all the Micronesian countries, including Solomon Islands, including Tuvalu, and I think from memory, we've got Palau, Federal States of Micronesia, uh, Marshall Islands, Kiribati, Nauru, Tuvalu, and Solomon Islands. Now, one of the things we, oh, sorry, and Papua New Guinea. One of the things that we have done is make sure that we have, we try to protect our oceans through very innovative programs like day fishing schemes, which we sell to uh, big distant fishing water na uh, fishing nations. And we use this to bring in the economy, economies, extra, extra economies into, into the countries of the, of the PNA, Pacific uh, Parties and Neuro Agreement. But at the same time, we put in there measures to ensure that it is a sustainable thing, that fishing in the region is sustainable. And, and because one of the big problems we have found, and this, I know, I think this, um, this data is out of date as of five. I, last time I read up on it was uh, a couple of years ago. So we were losing roughly about $6 billion in the illegal and unregulated uh, fishing, wow. IUU fishing. That's a lot of money. Mm -hmm. We're getting in return a fraction. Under a billion, we're getting in return. So we're losing more than we are gaining. Now, we cannot have a sustainable fisheries when the gain, when, sorry, when, when the loss far outweighs the gain. Because if you, and, and I must take my hat off to certain countries around the world that have taken on the initiative to say that if you're going to fish in the Pacific, and, and I give this to the uh, European Union, that if they say, if you're going to fish in the Pacific, we've got these laws that you need to comply with to ensure that what you've done does not fall within the definitions of what an IUU uh, 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 fishing vessel does. And for that matter, a lot of fishing uh, I suppose, is protected because other countries have taken the initiative. Not only us have taken the initiative to be able to protect what we have here. And that's what's important. The prosperity of an ocean this big is dependent on every, not just the people who live in this ocean, but dependent on those who are dependent on the resources of this ocean. It's not dependent on Nauru because we get the money from it and we get food from it. It is also dependent on other countries that fish and feed their people. Yes. Because it is a resource that is to be used well wisely so that everybody can eat from it. One of the great things that, uh, I wouldn't say a great thing, but one of the things I say is that when we use our resources wisely, mm -hmm. we not only feed ourselves, we not only feed our neighbour, but we can feed our grandchildren, their grandchildren, and their great great children, not just ours, but also that of our neighbors. Yeah. And so there must be a collective effort. We can't just say, I agree with you, network of bosses. Let's walk into a meeting and say, we are the network of bosses. Mm -hmm. But we need, we need to work together in all of this. And I assure you, one thing is definitely for sure, is I've never seen a fish carry a passport that says, if I'm going to go and sell into the waters of Nauru, I'm going to go to the waters of Kiribati, I'm going to have a passport to enter there. No, they swim everywhere, from one side of the ocean to the other. Yes. And, and therefore, I believe the prosperity, the blue prosperity in Pacific futures is advanced not just by the Pacific itself, but by everybody who depends on that resource that is here in the Pacific. Yes, that is so true. Um, I do think that... Um, the value, people cannot underestimate the value that small countries do bring, not only because, as you say, well, your waters are huge and therefore you do, you quote unquote, by the law, which most of the times the small islands didn't create these rule books anyway, but by these rule yes. books which we created, which we now live by, quote unquote, you do have some assets that if you help to manage and people help you manage it, helps us all. But what I'm, 
what what came up for me, and I want to go back to this idea about this technical relationship between small islands, because in addition to ICT, we're talking about water problems. We're talking about energy issues. We're talking about solid waste management issues, right? And one of the things I discovered, for example, when working in one of the big banks in Washington, D.C., was that many times you have, you know, I'd say the standard set of companies from Europe usually or Asia that get the contracts to build all this infrastructure. There's usually no technology transfer, number one. And quite mm. often you find a situation where um, it's very expensive for your water authorities, et cetera, to provide these sources. What I was talking to the Caribbean water movement guys about, we had a big meeting in June, and that's the one that President James Michel um, supported. We had a meeting on June 7th, which I, I declared World Island Day, to talk about some of these technical issues. <laughs> <laughs> you, you notice I, like I have a habit like of that. declaring things, right? Well, I thought it was perfect because June 5th is World Environment Day. June 8th is World Ocean. Then I said, well, we need a day. These are two big issues for us, but we want to focus on islands, but more so about the engineering of the development. How do you think the Pacific futures could shape up if, for example, the engineering infrastructure sector, which is your port people, your water people, your energy people, were to form, let's say, a buy-in cooperative, like a service buy-in cooperative that allows you to sort of make a better deal with your suppliers of your pipes, your et cetera, et cetera, because you're not just now buying as little never with 12,000 people, you only need 12,000 sinks, 12,000, whatever, you know, a band is a collective of, say, you know, a million well thing together. Because I am trying to tell the, the Caribbean people are saying this would work. And then I said, well, what if all 55 Alliance of Small Island States said, okay, we're meeting and we're doing the same exact thing we did for the last 50 years. Now we're in a new dispensation. We now have internet, we can talk to each other. Shouldn't you guys be talking? And I know for sure that the Caribbean Water Authority and wastewater people would love to have a, a conversation with your wastewater and water to say, hey, how can we create a, a coalition of, of small island infrastructure service providers on the government side to share data, share information, share knowledge about the companies that we're constructing so that we don't Basically, number one, get tanged in by people who don't do a good job of, we don't know, that's number one. And number two, we also can have different kinds of conversations with engineering companies and with companies that manufacture the goods that we need. How would you see that as a possibility in the Pacific region? Is that a possibility? Is that something that you know might work? Short answer, yes. Short answer, yes. The long answer is, I basically think that is an idea that is worth doing, not worth thinking about, not worth talking about, worth doing. Because one, because we are a, an association of small island developing states, or I should say we are an association of, of big ocean sustainable states. I like that term, boss. Uh, because we are... A, a, a bunch of bosses or a network of bosses. <laughs> we have very, we will have issues that are very common to each other. Mm -hmm. There are issues that it's common to us in regards to climate change, in regards to economies, in regards to health, in regards to education. I mean, you were talking about the Caribbean, the model that the USP, the University of South Pacific education model based on USP is actually based on the Caribbean model. Yeah. And so if you, Combine this, and I, I will I will support you on this one. You tell me the you, you ask us and who to write to, and we will write. We will send the diplomatic notes necessary to enable this because we need to bring that knowledge together. We need to start working on this. But let's let's stop. Fantastic idea. Let's go forward with it. Well, you just made my day. We can wrap up now, not, not quite, but, <laughs> but, but, but no, because, you know, 
I am um, the Caribbean Water and Water and Waste Management Authority. We have had this conversation. I've been talking to them since about April of this year, saying, and they're really fired up about this notion. So I will definitely be following up with you after this conversation to see how we can get um, this started because. The climate funds cannot just be used, as I say, what they claim as climate funds have to be used in very interesting ways and new ways. Another question I was thinking about is the climate mitigation efforts, right? Um, have you heard about the global carbon reward that was that Dr. Delton Chen, I think he's based in Australia, he has um, this digital currency construct, right? That um, um, actually was taken up by Kim Stanley Robinson in the book, The Ministry of the Future. I'm not sure if you've read that book. It's a very good book. I interviewed Kim about it. Um, and I said, I really love your book because it's really near future. It's really scary, but it is doable. We probably have to do something like this. And he said, this is one of the things that he really would like to do as a science fiction author. He really would like to activate that book. He said, it's his last book in this genre because he really wants action. So anything I do with this, he call him, he's there to be there. In actuality, I think he'll be speaking in Glasgow, right? On this matter. But the carbon reward currency he talked about was actually came up with the idea, Dalton Chen, and he says that it will need many central bank digital currencies to sort of back this idea. Now I'm asking you this because in the Caribbean, I think the Bahamas, now has something called a sand dollar. I think Barbados and Bermuda are also experimenting with digital currency, which is not the same as cryptocurrency. Has anybody in the Pacific region begin to talk about this digital currency paradigm as a way of working? Well, it hasn't been discussed at length here, but I have heard of the global carbon reward and, uh, just from reading uh, newspaper articles and, and hearing it pop up in the news. It is something I haven't looked at, to tell you the truth, quite uh, closely, because for one thing or another, I thought what it needs, it does need central banking to back it up. Yes. One of the reasons why I didn't look at it is because our banking system here is uh, an Australian, is Australian bank completely based on Australian laws. We can't move nor endorse anything of that nature, but we are, even though the author is Australian, and even though the uh, the articles, newspaper articles I, I, I read about it were Australian uh, newspaper articles, but we cannot. We're, we're basically locked in within a system of safe safeguarding our economy, and we have to comply with Australian law. So, if, so as they develop, and as they, if they want to develop this idea, then we will develop along with them. Yes. And, with, and, and, and for us, it is a safety net because yes. we do not have the, ex, the requisite expertise yes. nor the authority to be able to do things that touches on banking. And because yes. we rely on the laws of Australia, we have yes. to basically kowtow to their laws, which we find it is safer for, our, for us and therefore allows us to be able to be a vibrant economy with the help of an Australian bank. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I also want to touch on the issue of this paradigm shift towards sustainability, um, which is what my Smart Futures framework is about. And I'm going to focus on the M, because the S is of the sustainable systems, we all agree. But the M is very tricky because the M for me is about meaningful metrics. I am of the gospel that the GDP needs to be um, put into a box and sort of, you know, put on ice for a while because it's not really working for small islands. And I've been very impressed by the work that Wales is doing with its uh, Futures Generation Commission. Um, Indigenous peoples have for a long time been pushing ideas about harmony, living in harmony with nature and environment. Um, I'm excited by what the Maori in New Zealand have been doing with giving personhood to um, mountains and rivers, the people in Ecuador and Bolivia. And I really would want to ask you if any of this is happening in the smaller Pacific Islands, as if any of this move towards rethinking the rule books around 
how you measure success, and uh, how you measure well-being, happiness, good time and its growth and happiness, happiness index. Has there been any conversation in the Pacific region towards moving to these new ways of thinking about what the success constitutes as a country? Well, the interesting thing is because what we consider to be a successor in the Pacific is completely different to what is considered to be a success elsewhere. What is considered to be what is considered to be wealth here in the Pacific is considered not wealth in other parts of the world. So for us, uh, a good example is just in the way we use language. We would consider a well-off person as someone who is fat. You'd, you'd never call them fat. You'd never call them obese. You would, kill, you would call them healthy and wealthy. Whereas we see someone who's thin as someone who's oppressed, as someone who's hungry. So there is, there is a, already in existence a difference between how we rate successes, how we rate wealth. Unfortunately, what is put onto the Pacific is that because we have to operate at a level that is different from us, we've had to redefine how we say what wealth is, how we say what success is, how we say what is needed in regards to education. And because of introduced illnesses, and by the grace of God, we haven't got COVID-19 here, like COVID-19, we've had to change that paradigm shift in how we treat our people and how we look at things in the region. Now, fantastic that the Maoris in New Zealand give personhood to rivers, but that is what we also do here in the Pacific. Mm. Every single, if you go out on our reef, there's little uh, little channels. Every single one has a name, and mm. it's a person's name. Mm. There are things when you look at trees here, they're a person's name. Mm. So there's, we've always had that personhood in the things that we do because it touches the person. Now, coming back to living in harmony with nature, we try to live in harmony. One does try to live in harmony with nature, and I think everybody to a certain degree does do that. But for us, if somebody changes, if a, a big first world country changes the definition of success, and it's something that we need here, to, get, to be that successful. For example, fishing. Fishing, to be a successful fishing nation, you need a dock to be like this. You need a wharf to be like this. You need this kind of fishing vessels. To be successful at that, not based on our definition of what make, makes you a successful fishing nation, but based on what another country says makes you a successful fishing nation, then you'll have to comply with that definition. For the, for the average neuron, a successful fisherman is one who goes out, catches one fish, and feeds his family. A successful fisherman is also one that goes out, catches two fish, fishes, he feeds his family, and gives one to the to his next door neighbor. That's success. But because we have to, we are a fishing nation that we're trying to fix up our wharf, trying to fix up fix up our dock, so that we can start bringing in the big uh, motherships that 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 has. Uh, that fishes around our and our waters, we need to fix up our ports. And because our port has to comply with the laws of, of what makes it a safe port in accordance with what the US says, we've got to comply our ports in regards to the laws of the United States. Because if a fishing vessel comes here and our port does not comply with the laws of the USA, then that fishing vessel cannot offload its cargo in any other port that, for example, in American Samoa or in FSM, or in uh, Marshall Islands, because why? Those countries comply with the American rules. We we here, not having the resources, have had to find resources to be able to match what we consider to, what is considered and set by another country to be a success. Yeah, and that's part of the issue and why this conversation on the global system development goes and why there's a whole, um, I would say, group of people around the world trying to think, how do we, move some of these metrics which are not working for us, not as individual nations, but as a species. Because yes. that success has led to overfishing. That definition of success has led to overfishing. So it means that, again, the 55 votes that the Alliance of Big Ocean States, so the A buses have um, in some of these spaces, 
need to really be looked at again to say, okay, we have had this pause of COVID. I call it a holy pause, a transition, a pregnant pause, where humanity has to decide which way. And you are very fortunate, and I would like you to talk about this, um, in that COVID has really not penetrated. First of all, just tell us briefly, how did you manage to prevent COVID from taking hold in your population? Well, when COVID started making news headlines around the world, we became we made sure that we were very, very well in tune with what was happening around the world, exactly what, how the WHO was tracking. Now, the reason why we did this is because in our history, we had nearly been decimated as a people uh, through Spanish flu. Uh, Back in the early 1920s, Spanish flu came onto the island and wiped us till we were under 1,500 as a people. Wow mass graves all around the island, every wow. family suffered. Mm. And so from our history, we had learned what it meant mm. to have an illness come on island and decimate the population. One of the first, when we, when WHO declared a, a pandemic, we the next day went and declared a state of disaster here on Nauru, even though the pandemic was not yet here. And then we put in place on the, the day after uh, we declared it a state of disaster, we put in place the laws to protect us. It still meant we'd still have planes coming in, but we did things to make sure that every single element of people coming in here was we using them as a, we, we put them in a quarantine facility we were putting people in quarantined hotels before Australia even started doing it. We were introducing, we were introducing um, extra strength hand sanitizers even before other airlines were doing it in our airlines. We introduced body, uh, body temperature at, at airport gates even before any airline did it. We trained, we fully trained up our, all our steward, all our air, air host, uh, stewardesses and our stewards in first aid, in how to administer first aid, and especially training up in regards to hygiene, into uh, treating someone who was coughing, someone who sus you suspect's got COVID-19. We gave them all that training. They were the first crew to be able to have fully masked on, fully PPE'd out when they're receiving uh, passengers on a plane. We were the first plane to start issuing out PPE equipment to passengers as they were boarding to come to Nauru. We trained up our police. We trained up our security forces. We increased our police. Because we, when you put people into quarantine facilities, you've got to police them well. And the people who police them have to be trained. You can't just ordinarily take someone off the street and say, look after this gate. You've got to tell them you're looking after this gate because if somebody escapes from this quarantine facility and they've got COVID-19, you can get it. Your family will get it. And because we still yet not have been vaccinated, it could decimate the island. So we gave them all their training. We put laws in place to make sure we were following the constitution. We, 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 certain rights had to be basically put on hold for a while, but that, was, that, that right was for on everyone. Mm -hmm. On everyone. What's good for the goose, there's the same goods for the goose, uh, geese, good, good for the gander. <laughs> yeah, everyone. Yeah. Yeah. everyone. So yeah. there was no change. And then what we what we did then, of course, was because of this very strict regime, this, we were run, and we were running exercises. Every week we would run an exercise. What would happen if somebody escaped from the quarantine facility? What would happen wow. if somebody came off the plane and they and they had COVID-19? What are the protocols in place? So we basically ran every week for nearly six, seven weeks, all these different scenarios to make sure any. Even the wildest scenario, somebody of athletic ability pole, vault, pole vaults the fence and runs. <laughs> and we looked at that. Where do you shut down? Who do you inform? Who comes to your assistance? What? And because we ran them on a regular basis, we were able to. What would happen if somebody came on a ship? 
somebody's on a ship and it's got COVID. What do they do? What do you do if somebody swims ashore? We looked at all those scenarios. Wow. That's so... And, we, and, by, and, by, and by finding gaps in that, we were able to say, okay, we've got a gap here. Let's plug it. This is a good practice. Let's continue following it. This didn't work. Let's get rid of it. Wow. You're That's engineer? what engineer? Well, what do you mean by engineer? Are you, are you an engineer, trained engineer? No, I'm a barrister. You're, well, you're a different, you're a different kind of a barrister. You're actually. Well, and you're because like most people forget, most people forget, I was also, I was also an industrial chemist before I became a barrister. Ah, that is what it is. That's the <laughs> chemistry. <laughs> See, I know the science part of you speaking. You know, um, that kind of thinking and planning is really what's going to be necessary for taking us forward. And as I reflect again on what Wales is doing, have you given any thought, not just for Nauru, but for the whole region, for there to be like a Pacific, a Pacific Futures Commission or Pacific Futures Wellbeing Commission or something that's going to sort of codify some of these things that you have done and also want to do in terms of some of the softer goals around inequality and you know prosperity that, as I said, we need to find a metric that works, especially as Europe now is really interested in the, in, in the well-being index. Is it something you think that the Pacific futures might morph into, might begin to look at? I mean, this future generations what are some metrics for 2030 2040 2050 for those islands that may not exist because they're so flat and low-lying what are some mm. metrics for the well-being of those people who will have to find a new home elsewhere how will their emotional well-being be taken care of if their ancestral home no longer exists is there any conversation around these kind of futures challenges that are emerging because of climate change, for example? Well, some of those questions are legal in nature. Some of those questions are basically science in nature. The legal elements of, those, of, 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 of that question touches on, if I start losing my land, uh, my mass because of climate change, does it affect my EEZ? That's a legal question as well as an economic question. Mm -hmm. If I start losing my land to the point where I can't live on my land any longer, what's the science that can help me remain on my land? And sometimes that can be a very tough science. And sometimes that science has not yet been found. The other question, of course, is it is also a legal question is if somebody is to migrate and leave because of climate change, how is that recognized under migration laws? Mm. The Refugee Convention right now is limited in regards to its definition. You're limited to being a refugee under war or under mm. discrimination. But what happens when you lose your country mm. on a threat that is not of your making? That's equivalent to a war. What happens if you lose your livelihood? And, and, and believe it or not, women are more susceptible in this area. Always will be. Where there is a situation of crises, women and children suffer more than men. It's, it's, it's the way of the world. It's ine inevitable. And so a woman would be here. Uh, let me use Kiribati or Tuvalu as an example. Both. Pacific countries, all Marshall Islands, both three Pacific countries are really are facing the brunt of climate change. They have people there whose houses have stopped existing because they are now underwater. Mm. There are people there who've got real estate who've stopped being a landowner because they've lost that real estate. It's underwater. The, I suppose the food they used to farm has gone because why? Salt water, brackish water is coming. Mm. Change the kind of fish they're able to get. Why? Because there's a greater distance. Gone are the little fish you can, uh, the, the kind of, uh, I suppose, fish like that you can get closer to shore because shore has changed. The shore has changed. 
Now, take if I was someone from Kiribati, and they're doing this, they've been putting up their hand and say, please help us. So some countries have come to that assistance. Some have not. We have discussed climate change till I suppose we're blue in the face. We've set goals that countries are still arguing. What more does the Pacific need to do? What more do countries suffering under climate change need to do? Is it not enough that we are losing land? Is it not enough that we are losing identity? Does it take lives to be lost because of climate change? It is the biggest threat ever faced to the human race right now, climate change. I think finding the answer is going to be very tough because there needs to be a collective taken up by everyone in regards to this. This is, this is not a battle just for countries being affected by climate change. This is a battle that needs to be taken up by those who are not affected by climate change. Because believe it or not, the pressure will be on them. Just as much as the pressure is on us in the Pacific suffering from climate change. I, I, I don't have an answer. I really don't. I, I see what needs yeah. to be done. I see yeah. what needs to be done. But all I'm hearing now is talk, 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 and talk. They say, I mean, the ESG of the UN just jumped up and down. He comes, he came to the Pacific, he went to Tuvalu, he had, he's seen the devastation. He's been championing it. I haven't seen really any distinct movement in that area to say, okay, Pacific, or okay, your country is suffering from climate change. This is the assistance we'll give. There has been assistance given, and I have to be fair in that regard. The port we're building is because of, from the climate, I think it's a green, green climate fund. Mm -hmm. We've been able to access money from that to build our port to be a mitigating factor against climate change. But that kind of assistance, the red tape you have to go through, is thicker than most. The countries that you have to, that have to say yes, believe it or not, every single country on the Green Climate uh, Fund, every single country has to say yes. If one says no, you're gone. You can't get the loan. You can't get that assistance. So there needs to be a rethink even in that direction. Yes. I, one of the things I'd like to say is that I do think in terms of this climate change, this idea of our shared future, that certainly for islands in the Pacific, which are so far from, let's say, the mainstream of the Washington consensus of kind of controlled things, we definitely need to have more friends you know, yes. friends that are championing your cause. As a, I'm a Caribbean diaspora organizer, right? So in addition to my real work as an engineer and a futurist, I spent a lot of hours <laughs> trying to get Caribbean diaspora to speak up to Congress to agitate. And I was actually responsible for the US Congress and the President Bush in 2006, declaring June as Caribbean American Heritage Month. The good thing is that we have at least people in Guam and Hawaii who feel an affinity, an affinity for the people in the Pacific independent countries. And right. again, in June, because of my, okay, we have to do something different. I mean, COVID really kind of had me, okay, what we're gonna do now? Because of COVID, basically, I spent a lot of time now reaching out to people in Guam to say, how do we partner with the people in Guam, with the Caribbean people, because you have Caribbean islands, which are American owned in the Caribbean Sea, and we have American islands which in the Pacific Ocean. And so we have the potential now to create new types of partnerships, which perhaps without the internet and those things would have been hard, but now it's not so challenging. So as we wrap up, I mean, think about the fact that you know, we're nine years away from 2030. We've had a lot of time to reflect and regroup. And um, we're thinking of the SDGs, we're thinking of this vision, and people are saying, oh, it's going to take 80 years. We don't have 80 years. We really don't have 80 years 
to get to the safe, just space for humanity that the donut economic school, which I prefer to call lifesaver economic school, um, talk about. So how might you and other presidents of small island nations or big ocean um, sustainable states help to create a community of practice within your own nation states, as well as allies like myself who live in the shadow of the halls of the US Congress and the White House um, to sort of advance some of what it is you're doing. How can, how can we have to shape Pacific futures alongside you as you are trying to shape these things for sustainability, for thriving, for flourishing? I like the word flourishing because it just sounds flourishing, right? How can, how <laughs> can, how can we create this I've lost you. I can't hear you. I can't hear you. I can't hear you. I don't know what's happening. Ah, there you go. You need to repeat the last 10 seconds. Okay. So I'm saying, how can we create an allyship between your, the civil society in the Pacific and civil society in the Caribbean? How can leaders like yourself help us to create that partnership? so we can support you in shaping futures which are flourishing. Well, let me do this for you. Yes. I will contact civil societies of the region. That's the international, the international ones first, the regional ones, and then of course the national ones here. And I'll pass on your contacts to them. Mm -hmm. Then you can start having that discussion. And of course, as you are well aware that most uh, civil society organizations, most CSOs work and when they operate, when work well, is when they work and operate under the blessing of government and in conjunction with government's policies and vision. Yes. And because they can touch on the things that government wants to, for example, like uh, gender equality. Mm -hmm. you know, I might have a department of gender that's doing gender uh, sensitivity stuff but i would have a cso who'd probably have experts in that area could be able to complement what they what, what the department of gender is doing and go forward with that so let me do that for you i'll connect i'll connect you to all of these people i'll use our secretary of the cabinet first of all to the international uh, uh civil society organizations that we have in the region then the regional one the one that shall work regional when i mean by when i mean by international i mean the big international uh, CSOs uh, that are working here in the region. When I mean by region, I mean the regional ones that are started and just work in the region, and of course the national ones also. That would be wonderful. And of course, we've already agreed that the infrastructure departments of the Alliance of Big Ocean Sustainable States should get together to create this technical working group around shared practices, shared services, agreements, and those sorts of things. My last question then is, what do you see on your horizon for um, 2030? What is your hope for 2030 and beyond? 2030 and beyond. What's your hope? Oh. My hope is that we've stopped illegal fishing in the Pacific. My hope is that climate change action is actually being actioned. My hope is that access for Pacific countries into the bigger economies of the other of the first world countries is made much, much, much easier than what it is now. And by access, I mean access. Let, let me qualify that. I'll use Nauru as an example. Because of our size, because of our limited population, there is only limited things that we can do on island. But for us to expand our knowledge and our, to expand that expertise, we need to be able not just to go to school in other countries, but to work in those countries, grab that knowledge and bring it back. That's one, that's one of the things that, that's what I mean by having easier access 
into the bigger economies because you can only learn from those bigger economies and pump back that economy back into into the Pacific. Labor mobility scheme is a fantastic is a fantastic idea, but it needs to be more than a labor mobility scheme. It needs to have experts be needs to have grab people here, train them here, send them to another country, give them that expertise that's needed there, and bring them that. That's that's a hope. I want to be able to to have a united as you say, the boss countries, united in all the things that they do that is similar to each other. But at the same time, when a country expresses its individuality, those other countries also support that individuality. And I think that'll be a great thing because yes, there are individual needs of different countries and the smaller you are, the bigger you are, all those needs are different and they can be and they will be individual. But to have, I'm trying to remember the guy who said, I might differ, I might not believe in your right that you believe is your right, but I am willing to die for your right that is your right. Mm. To what? To what? Yes, that's the correct word. Okay, to what? Thank you. Thank you for this very insightful conversation on the future of the Pacific, Pacific Futures as begat by you. Uh, Your Excellency, Honorable Lionel Ruen and Jamea. We're so grateful for you joining us in this very special edition of Future Sense Now in my case, which is my conversation series, where we really explore succinct ideas and sustainable futures. And on this occasion of the World Future Society Federation, uh, World Future Studies Federation, sorry, that is happening in Berlin today. We will do co-create the future we want. So until next time, hopefully we do meet. As we say in Jamaica, walk good. The Pacific possible, futures are possible. Ubuntu. Thank you very much, Dr. Claire. And to you, I'll use your own words, walk good. But in our, in, <laughs> in our word, we say, uh, because we are a Christian nation, we'll say walk with God. And may he bless the path that you take. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Take care. Take care.